song we're going to sing is Christ is enough, and he is enough for everything that we have ever needed. And so as we sing, think about what we're singing. He is enough. Christ is enough for me. My sin remained a dirty stain, a good, good not erased. Then Jesus came, my sin he prayed, and cleansed me by his grace. To Christ the mind on him rely, his grace is Next song we'll sing is a very familiar song. It's called Bringing in the Sheaves. We'll sing the first and last verse, Bringing in the Sheaves. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noontime and the dewy in, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing. Bringing in the sheaves, going forth with weeping, sowing for the master, though the loss sustained our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. This morning's scripture reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip, 
went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voices, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Think about that great joy as we sing. We're going to stand and sing across the lands. Let's sing one more song as we stand. We'll sing across the lands. You're the word of God the Father from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory. Let the land and seas rejoice. You're the author. It's wonderful to have uh, Pastor Matt with us um, this morning and uh, just uh, thankful for the opportunity to uh, get to know him a little bit better. Uh, and I know it's been 10 years since he's been here last time, uh, but one of the greatest things that I um, appreciate and respect uh, about both of them is that where you're seated at right now and the place that we're able to worship in, he was here from the very beginning of our building. Uh, and uh, so that goes way back. Uh, and uh, so I'm just grateful and thankful that they're here uh, as missionaries with Continental Baptist Missions. Uh, they were uh, builders uh, with Continental Baptist Missions for many years and were very integral in the building of this building here. Uh, and uh, they have come uh, back and just to give a report of their church planning ministry there in Eureka, Montana. And I know you'll uh, really appreciate it as he comes and speaks to us this morning. Let's give him a hand, Matt Shrepfer. Thank you, Pastor Andy. That was very delightful. It was, it's delightful for Juanetta and me to be back, too. Thank you very much for you making it possible for us to combine being at the National Pastors Fellowship early last week and us being able to be here to report to Evangel Baptist on this Sunday as well. Thank you for making that possible, Pastor Andy, and thank you for your hospitality and and just the privilege that it is to be able to be back. I'm going to take the liberty, if anybody doesn't want your picture taken, just go ahead and cover your face. And Carl, you're not allowed to cover your face. But anyway, <laughs> I want to uh, share with our church folks back in Montana, approximately, I guess I could do this in a little different way, but I'll combine those pictures. Thank you, everyone, for letting me do that. I do need to... I have an illustration that I will use in just a few moments, so bear with me on that. At any rate, I, Juanetta and I want to thank you for praying for us and for your support for us and for the ministry and Eureka. 
it is a mission church still, and yet we're working in the direction of becoming an autonomous or indigenous church where we are self-governing and yet we're not self-supporting yet. And we're working toward that. We've taken many steps toward that as we shared in the Sunday School Hour. And one, of, one that's on the horizon for us is our own building. Right now we're renting a building. It is a nice building, and, but it was a motorcycle sales and repair shop before we moved in, and we really don't have room to grow much. But by God's grace, when we do build, and right now we're scheduled with Continental Baptist Mission's help for the spring of 2023, we will let you know, and maybe some of you can come and be part of that, as we were privileged to come and be part of this building here. It was a delight back in 2001 through 2003 to be here among you folks, and I guess I, I can't say thank you enough, but thank you very much for that. <clears throat> As we begin today, I'm going to say that I titled this the same as our Valley Baptist Church Youth. Our, our youth group chose the name Ambassadors for Christ from 2 Corinthians 5.20 several years ago. And so I, I, even, I even titled this message, An Ambassador of Christ. And that's the challenge. Are you an ambassador of Christ? As we just read a few minutes ago in Acts chapter 8, Saul, who, of course, you would better know as the Apostle Paul, was consenting to the death of one of the early church members in Jerusalem. His name was Stephen. And yet, though that persecution that began, verse 4 tells us, therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word, is actually fulfillment of what God commanded them to do. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, there's kind of an outline of the book of Acts. And Luke wrote these words of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in your Bibles, they would be in red, if you have a red letter edition. The Lord Jesus Christ, before he ascended up to heaven, said, but ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, they didn't do it. So for the first eight chapters of the book of Acts, we find the believers just kind of staying among their own in the city of Jerusalem. But because there was persecution, and I believe that persecution was either brought about or allowed by God, you can debate that issue, but at any rate, God used that to scatter them abroad, and they went everywhere preaching the word. Let's not face it that way. Let's do what God says without having to be persecuted to do so, dear Christian. If that's all you get out of this sermon today, I guess that would be enough. Acts is an exciting book in our Bibles. We do realize that later on in Acts chapter 13, they began missionary journeys and sent missionaries out of the local church in Antioch to go around the known world in that day. And Yet here in Acts chapter 8, we find a unique setting. There was a man whose name was Philip that God sent to Samaria. And you see, Peter and John had gone north from Jerusalem to observe the work of God in Samaria. And the Jews in those days had no dealings with the Samaritans. They considered them a pagan or a heathen people because of their mixed religion and their mixed heritage john 4 verse 9 even jesus addressed or it's addressed there but now philip one of those seven men chosen out by the church in acts chapter 6 philip was chosen as a deacon in the church in jerusalem had gone there and preached salvation through belief in the lord jesus christ and many got saved many trusted jesus christ as savior so eight, chapter 8 verse 6 says and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles he did. And because they believed, what does verse 8 say? And there was great joy in that city. Dear Christian, when a person comes to know the Lord Jesus Christ, there ought to be joy. Amen. Joy here and joy in the presence of the angels in heaven over one sinner that repents. It ought to bring joy. Well, the apostles in Jerusalem heard of this and sent Peter and John to confirm it. They heard about what was going on through the preaching of Philip, and they went to confirm it. And sure enough, many of the Samaritans were now truly Christians. 
So after dealing with, they had some opposition, and there will always be opposition, by the way. After they faced some opposition from one Simon, we read verse 25. So jump ahead to Acts 8, 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. That, of course, is Peter and John. And preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And they reported then to the church in Jerusalem what was going on over in Samaria. Even though they, as a, a, a nationality, were not excited, per se, about this, they should have been. God was doing a new work, and his word was spreading, the gospel was spreading to Samaria, just as Jesus told them they should. Verse 26 says this, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. So God had sent one of his angels, the, uh, the Greek word angelos, meaning a messenger from God to Philip to speak to him. God doesn't speak that way to us today. He speaks to us through his word. But before the word of God was complete, God often did that. And this angel told Philip what he needed to do. And the contents of the angel's message from God were just simple. It was just straightforward, simple enough. He said, arise. Well, why Philip was seated, we don't know. Maybe he'd had a long day in ministry and he was tired. But the angel said, get up, arise, Philip. Go toward the south. Did you see that in verse 26? That meant from Samaria, he would be going back to Jerusalem, and then he would take that highway that went southwest to Memphis, Egypt, along the Mediterranean coast through Old Gaza. The angel told him that much. Now, Gaza back then had been a city occupied by the Philistines, but that city had been destroyed in 93 BC. So Gaza itself was no longer, it was a ghost town, if you will. So the angel's reference to desert, that desert place there in verse 26, was two possibilities. One was either that Old Gaza was deserted, or that the road went through deserted country, or desolate country. Now, okay, that's the message that the angel gave to Philip. That sounds easy enough, right? To rise, go south. But for how many miles? How far? And... And since I don't know how far, how much should I take with me? Should I take a lot of food with me? Should I take gallons and gallons of water? He didn't know. He was just to arise and go in that direction. Would God take care of him? Oh, yes, God would take care of him. Philip had learned somehow that God would, was faithful to him, and he was to be faithful to God. What was he to do on this trip? The angel didn't tell him what you were going to do on this trip what he was going to do on that trip. And so, how was he to do what he didn't know what he was going to do? What did he have to prepare? As we prepared to come here, we put together a PowerPoint and some messages, and we did some preparation to come here. We had to buy airline tickets and, and, <laughs> and all of that, but Philip didn't have that information. He didn't. How long would he be gone? It sure makes a difference on how you plan a trip if you know how long you're going to be gone, doesn't it? Sure it does. And what else should he take? I could imagine a man of action like Philip saying, just a minute, Lord, I need a little bit more information. <laughs> you mean you want me to start traveling south and that's it? Well, as we'll see, Philip was a man of action and just start traveling south would be not enough information for the normal person. Dear Christian, way too many never get around to doing what the Lord asks them to do because of these reasons, waiting on more information. They don't know enough about where, how long, or what it would take, or what preparation they'd need. They'd want to know more details before they go in the direction that God has led them to do. And he does it 
through his word, most often, and the impression of the Holy Spirit upon the heart. It's kind of like young couples who want to wait until they have a large home and the home paid off and two cars in the garage, both of them paid off, secure in, the, in their careers, and have good health insurance before having children. You know what Juanetta and I tell them? Then you'll never have children. They, that is just the way it would go. They would get too wrapped up in all of that, and they would not have children. Many, of, many in this room know what I'm talking about. You've had children when you didn't know how you'd pay for that little thing, that little one. <clears throat> Juanetta and I similarly have met several couples who were convinced that God had called them to serve him as missionaries or in some sort of ministry, but they didn't know what that ministry was or they didn't know where they would go or they didn't know how they would pay for it and they didn't like the idea maybe of deputation. How would it all work out financially? They just didn't know the details and so we'll wait until we know how these things will work out, they tell us, and we tell them similarly. Really? Then you'll never do it. You don't need to know step two, three, and four. But when God shows you step one, take it, dear Christian. The Lord, you'll never know, follow the Lord's leading if you need to know every step to the goal. Usually, God just simply gives us one step at a time. And that truth is borne out in our passage and this is not, it doesn't take rocket science to figure this one out because verse 26 is before verse 29. Okay, verse 26, we just read it. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, go toward the south, under the way that goeth down from Jerusalem to Gaza, which is desert. Okay, that's the, that's the instruction, the message. Verse 29 says, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. It came for, his obedience to head southwest was necessary, and then God showed him more. Then God showed him more. So somehow Philip had learned to trust God and obey him without requiring God to show him step two. And he did go south and west. Verse 27 says, he arose and went. So the angel said, Arise, and he arose, verse 27, and went. I like that. You need to do that. I need to do that. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, he read Isaiah, the prophet. I notice now that because Philip arose and went just as he was told to in verse 26, we have, and behold. Behold in the Greek is like shouting up from the rooftop. Behold, look what now happened. <laughs> Obedience comes first, though. You're not going to get a behold in your life if you don't obey first, dear Christian. That is a lesson we all must learn. And then see what God does next. This man served, this Ethiopian fellow served the queen of Ethiopia. Her name or title was Candace. And that was south of Egypt in northern Africa. And this man was a eunuch, it says. And that could sometimes mean a physical eunuch. But other times the term is used of a high-ranking official, a court officer, if you will. There was a similar situation back in the days of Pharaoh in Egypt when Joseph went down and became the slave of one Potiphar. Potiphar was a married man who was an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of, of the guard in Egypt. You can see that in Genesis chapter 39 for yourself. The context here, though, would point to this Ethiopian being a man of great authority. A physical eunuch was not in a high position as this man was. He also had oversight of the queen's treasury and, of course, great authority under Candace. Candace was a dynastic title used by many women rulers of Ethiopian history. 
similar to the title Pharaoh, or you know, king of Egypt. And there were many men that used the dynastic title Pharaoh. This was a Candace of Ethiopian history. He had gone, this, this fellow from Ethiopia had gone to Jerusalem, verse 27 tells us that, for to worship. So at some point in his life, he had converted to Judaism. He was a Jewish proselyte. Not a Christian, but a Jewish proselyte. And God had a plan for this man from Ethiopia, and Philip was part of that plan. Philip was included in that plan. Dear Christian, God has a plan for this world and many people in it. Will you be included in that plan? Will you be included in the blessings of that, or will you be excluded? The choice is yours. Philip chose to be included in God's plan, and it made a difference worldwide. It's incredible. Philip obeyed and promptly, and thus was included and blessed by God. This dear Ethiopian was reading scripture that day and searching God's word, and he sensed he was missing something. Here he was, a Jewish proselyte from North Africa, and he thought he was missing something. So he was struggling to find it out. He was reading out of the Old Testament. This was a work of the Holy Spirit. God does that sometimes when people sense they're missing something. <clears throat> and I want to get to a text that I received a few months ago because it will touch your hearts. There have been many that I have run into or been able to talk with over the years that <clears throat> were ready somehow. Maybe they had heard the gospel message over the radio or by someone else, maybe their wife. I think of Bill Hobart back in the day when his wife Tammy had talked and talked and talked to him about accepting Jesus as a savior and he was tired of it. And one day he and I were out grouse hunting and he was sitting in the passenger seat of my pickup as we were driving along, and <clears throat> Bill said, about this Christianity stuff, I'd like to hear a little bit more about it. So I pulled off the road, and we talked, and he was ready. It had really very little to do with me, except I was there that day. This fellow knew he was missing something. Bill knew he was missing something. <laughs> there was a fellow named Darren Bertolini that thought he was missing something that I had the privilege to share the gospel with and lead to Christ years ago just because he knew he was missing something. He thought he was a Christian, but he was missing something. This Ethiopian fellow thought that he was on the right track with God, but he was missing something, and he really was missing something. A few months ago, Juanetta and two other ladies were scheduled to meet for a, a library committee meeting at our little mission church in Eureka, Montana. Yes, we have a library, and that is a good thing. But they, I believe that the devil tried to thwart that. The communication about the time of meeting and the subject, that got confused. And it, actually, it seemed like <clears throat> that meeting wasn't going to happen. But because Juanetta and the ladies were so gracious with each other, they worked out their schedules and made it work anyway. It seemed like the devil didn't want them there that day. I chose to go with Juanetta. <clears throat> I could work on some other things. But if they had any questions for me about what books to weed out of the library or what books to buy for the library, I would like to be consulted. You know, that would be good. So I was there that day. <clears throat> and lo and behold, there was a divine appointment that happened. <clears throat> it was a Tuesday in the early afternoon, and we were not normally at the building Tuesday early afternoon. That was not normal for us. And this fellow <clears throat> drove up. Tom is about 70 years old, and he had California plates on his, his Ford Explorer, and he came up to the door, and Juanetta met him at the door, and <clears throat> he had some questions. And my sweetheart said, well, you've come to the right place. And he said, I have. <laughs> and she said that I could meet with him, and that if I didn't have the answers, I would have the answer source book. And I did. And so Tom and I sat down in my Sunday school classroom and talked about his background a little bit to get to know him and I gave him a little bit about our background and then we got into the gospel message he understood that he was a sinner 
he understood that, of course, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but he also understood, as I shared with him the gospel message, that <clears throat> what we deserve for that is death and separation from God in the lake of fire. He, under, he had a, a, some sort of knowledge of that, but he had never made it his own. I shared with him then, of course, Romans 5.8 that says <clears throat> that God commandeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That you need to believe in Jesus Christ, I shared with him, as God who paid the price for your sins. He died for you, Tom, and for your sins. And I asked him after we talked it through, are you ready to do that? And he said, I would like to think about it a little bit more. And I appreciate that. That does not scare me. I want people to know what they're doing. I want it to be real between them and God. And I said, well, Tom, now you know what God says in the Bible and what you should do. It, and you can do it at any place you want to. You could do it at home at night. I knelt beside my bed when I was a 17-year-old and confessed my sin to God and asked him to save me, believing that Jesus died for my sins and Jesus is God and that he rose again, just as the Bible says. I believe in him. Please save me, I asked God. And he did. I told him that my brother Bill, who I had witnessed to until he got tired of it, <laughs> one night pulled off the road, put his head on the steering wheel of his pickup, and confessed his sin before God and accepted Jesus Christ as his Savior. I said, Tom, tomorrow when you're going to Thompson Falls, when you go past Bull Lake, you could pull off the road and do this if you want it. If this is what God has impressed upon you to do, you can do it. So this is his text. Good morning, Matt. After much contemplation yesterday and long into the night, I asked Jesus to forgive me for my sins. I want to believe and have him in my life. It was a struggle to leave California. It's not that I had trouble leaving my home, but it seems like forces were making the move so very complicated with problems at every step. I believe it was God who gave me the strength to persist. Moving to Montana, I feel, was truly a blessing. Thank you again for your time yesterday. I think our meeting each other yesterday was not an accident. With your help, I would like to take my next step in the journey. Isn't that precious? So we started meeting for basic Bible studies. It wasn't long. And Tom said, I want to be baptized. And he understood what baptism pictured. And so he was baptized in Sophie Lake in August, and we had a picnic, and it was a delight. It was a joy-filled time for me and for him and for our whole church family. <clears throat> Dear friend, this Ethiopian fellow was a divine appointment. God may give you divine appointments, and be ready. Be ready. Philip was ready. He arose, and he went, and he was ready. He knew what Old Testament scripture pointed to, and that's, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can do the same. Study your Bibles and, and learn a basic way of sharing the gospel. Pastor will help you with that. Many of you here would help others. Philip went, and this Ethiopian knew he was missing something, but there was this divine appointment. <clears throat> this dear Ethiopian was reading scripture that day. Verses 28 and 29 tell us he was returning and sitting in the chariot. He read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Now, I've pondered modes of transportation in that day. Common folks were on foot, and they had sandals, maybe worn-out ones, but that's how they traveled. The more wealthy used donkeys, but the distance was limited. Those who were an upper class, like Abraham of old, they used camels. The distance was far greater, but the most wealthy used chariots, and horses. <clears throat> and chariots and horses were the fastest mode of travel. When we were here, we had just poured the slab for this building, and we started to set up the steel structure. <clears throat> we had a volunteer with us that had been going to Clearwater Christian College. He was from Morocco. And I do remember the setting very much. It was September 11th, 2001, and he was afraid because of his appearance. And I understand that. But we got to talking a little bit about Morocco. Of course, Juanette and I communicated a lot that day. <clears throat> but 
he told me that most people in Morocco don't have cars. Very few do, only the wealthy. Some have bicycles, but most ride donkeys in Morocco. He said, but everybody has a cell phone. So they're riding donkeys with a cell phone. It's kind of an interesting picture in my mind. <laughs> what could have, what, you know, Philip could have had an excuse here, couldn't he? There's no way I can catch up to that chariot, God. All I have are these two worn out sandals and he's in a chariot. I can't catch up to him. But Philip was a man who ran. No, not Philip. Verse 30 says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Wow. Philip arose, he went, he ran, and he listened. Good for Philip. There's a lesson here for you and for me. He was a man of action. He was sold out to God. And he chose to include himself in God's plan for this Ethiopian and, by the way, many others because now when this ethiopian had accepted christ as his savior he returned home to north africa now the gospel made it to africa dear friend praise god for that how did that all begin philip's obedience and then philip's question in verse 30 understandest thou what thou readest you know verse 31 says and he said how can i except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. It's an amazing paradox, but it is a biblical one. God is all-powerful. God is all-knowing. And in every way, able to communicate the gospel message. He could do it through rocks or trees or angels or whatever he chose to. But the paradox is this. As the holy, true, and right God, he has chosen to entrust the gospel message to man, to you and to me. He's chosen to do it that way. What a paradox. To take it to others. He doesn't have to do it that way, but he does. Romans 10, 17, of course, tells us, so then faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. God has chosen to do that. Dear Christian, if you are part of that, maybe like Philip, his feet were probably dusty, but they were beautiful. Romans 10, 14 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of them that carry that message. What an amazing thing. But it's true. And Philip made the choice to be an ambassador for Christ that day. Will you do that? Philip listened, and then he asked the question that we just read. And the fellow was reading Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. You can cross-reference that. That's easy to do. In Acts chapter 8, it comes out this way, in verse 32 and 33. If you compare the two, it helps some. The place of the scripture, verse 32, which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, dumb before his shearer. So opened he, not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. That was the passage that that Ethiopian was reading that day. Most likely in the New Testament Septuagint Greek translation of the Old Testament Masoretic text, which Isaiah 53 would be the Old Testament, and we have it in the Masoretic form. He was most likely reading it in the Greek translation, the language of that day. Now, Philip had the trust of this Ethiopian somehow already, maybe because he was a fast runner and this Ethiopian fellow knew that God was in this somehow. Maybe there was a divine appointment here, but he had the trust of this Ethiopian officer and asked the question, verse 34. And the eunuch answered, I'm sorry, verse 30, yeah, the question. And the eunuch answered and said, I'm sorry, answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? God will often open a door for you like this. 
they may ask you the question, who, what is this about? What, who is this speaking of? If you're faithful to him, he may open that opportunity for you. I don't know how many times I and others that I know have started to witness of Christ to someone who was ready already. I remember a little boy in vacation Bible school. His name was Emmett. He's a genius, by the way. And when I asked Emmett, why did you raise your hand when I gave the invitation at the end of the Bible lesson in VBS today? A lot of kids will answer the question because I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Emmett said, I've been thinking for several days now, and I even stayed up late last night thinking about this. And I want to become a Christian. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. He was that sharp. He was ready. This fellow was ready, and Philip was there. And Philip asked the right question, and this fellow answered, uh, asked him a question as well. So Philip let the word of God do its work. He didn't reason. He didn't argue. He didn't try to bring, bring in creationism versus evolution. He didn't do all of that stuff. He told it as it is. Christ. Look at verse 35. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. That's the key, dear friend. If Jesus is the key. Now, a person can learn that creation is absolutely biblical and logical and right. But what they really need is Christ. They need Jesus. And Philip went straight there and preached to him, to, unto him, just as it is, Christ. What did he tell the Ethiopian about Jesus? Well, we have to try to fill in some blanks here. When it says, like in Isaiah 53, that he was slaughtered for our sins, he preached unto him that Jesus fulfilled that. He gave his life and shed his blood on the cross for your sins, Ethiopian fellow, and for mine. He suffered just as God, God's word said, and he did so silently, just like Isaiah 53 says. And he did it in our place, verse 33. That in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. He did it for you, he did it for you in just payment for your sins. It was just judgment upon him. Literally, he died as a sacrifice, that final sacrifice for sin. Now, our text doesn't tell us, but Jesus is alive, and I'm sure Philip testified to that fact that he rose again, just as the scripture says on the third day. Verse 36 then comes along. Why would he ask this? And as they went on their way, they came to a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Why would he ask a question like that? Good. <laughs> I'm glad that he did. It was understood in those days that a new convert from one religious system to another would show publicly his changed heart and his new faith by being baptized. And that would be by immersion. The word baptizo says, says you know, it means that underwater. And we'll see that in just a moment. He was a changed man. Now, as Juanetta shared her testimony, she sat in one of the front pews in the chapel at camp and right there in that pew before talking with anybody else must have bowed her head and confessed her sin and accepted Jesus Christ as her savior. That happens in a moment, dear Christian. It happens in a moment. If you're not saved, you're not yet a Christian, but you can do that right now, right where you're sitting. This Ethiopian must have done that. He was a changed man and he wanted to show it. You know what? <laughs> because of who he was, he had a procession of about a hundred soldiers behind him. He was a man of great authority and likely was a centurion. He had, we don't know exactly how that worked, but he had a, a whole parade behind him. And he was ready to show, I now believe, I now know who Isaiah 53 was talking about, and it's Jesus Christ, who died for my sins, was buried, and rose again. I want to show that by being baptized. So, I'll tell you what, <laughs> he wanted to he was a changed man. He was now converted to Christ. Verse 37 is really important in our Bibles. And Philip wanted to make sure. He wanted to make sure. Dear Christian, it's not wrong to make sure. You ask some more questions and be ready to give them 
some means of assurance. I'm going to just make a very quick comment about this. Some Bible translations omit this verse. I would say they're unreliable. This is key to the passage. The whole context points to it. Verse 37, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what it takes. He was now saved. He was now born again. Baptism doesn't save. But Philip wanted to make sure that with his heart, that man believed. Believest with all thine heart. Once Philip is sure, the whole procession stops. They stop the chariot, and they get down in and go into the water, verse 38, and they come up out of the water. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that he, the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. And all who trust Christ as Savior ought to have a rejoicing in their heart, and all who are saved ought to rejoice when one does. Wow. Well, the meaning of that baptism is right there for you. If you want a proof text, there it is. We say the meaning determines the mode. The meaning pictures the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philip took the eunuch down into the water, and he was under the water, and they came up out of the water. And then the Lord caught away Harpazzo Philip and snatched him up, plucked him away. But that wasn't the focus of this. The rejoicing of the new convert was the focus of this. Philip was used of God, included in his plan for the ages, blessed by God. Why? Because he arose, he went, he ran, he listened, he told the truth about Christ, he gave spiritual guidance to this man about baptism to the Ethiopian as he had been and baptized him, of course, or at least pointed him in that direction. Philip was no one of particularly special talents or abilities. The Bible doesn't tell us that he was a special orator or a gifted individual or wealthy or anything like that. No, Philip was ordinary. Philip was a man, he was not a man of wealth. He was poor as far as we can tell. And God uses ordinary people. And it doesn't depend on wealth or ability with, or skills. God will use your abilities and skills, but it doesn't depend on, on those. This man, Philip, was saved by grace through faith in Christ. He was a baptized believer as part of the church in Jerusalem. And now he was out spreading the gospel to others. He was part of a local church, a member, if you will. Maybe that's a challenge for you today. I don't know. Maybe you need to trust Jesus as your Savior. Do it right there where you're sitting. Tell pastor about it. He'll rejoice with you. Maybe you need to be baptized. You can make that decision today. Maybe you need to be a local church member. Philip would have been part of or identified with that church in Jerusalem, and now he was sent out along the road to Gaza. Maybe you need to be a church member. You can make that decision today. I challenge you to do it. Do what God would lead you to do. Philip did what God led him to do. Will you? He was an ambassador of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you can be as well. Heavenly Father, O Lord God, I don't know the hearts of those who are here today. You do. You do better than they. And O Father in heaven, there may be decisions that need to be made during the time we have left together this morning. And Father, I ask you that they would make those decisions. Thank you for Philip's obedience and the example that is to us. Thank you for this fellow from Africa that did trust Jesus Christ as his Savior and showed that publicly through water baptism and went on his way rejoicing. Father, I ask you that there would be rejoicing today in what you're doing. Father, I also ask you that we would yield our hearts to you, each and every one of us, whether we've been Christians for one year or 30 years or more, that day by day we would be used of you in the center of your will and ready to 
arise and go at a moment's notice. Father, thank you for your word, which clearly tells us the way of salvation. I ask you that everyone who is born again will learn it and share it with others. And Father, that your work would go forward through the ministries of Evangel Baptist Church, both here in the Lakewood Ranch area, around Florida, and across the globe. Father, thank you for who you are, that you save souls, that you change lives, and that we can rejoice in what you do. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet quietly, if you will, and we're going to sing the song, Jesus is Calling. It's page 327 in your hymn, hymnal. I appreciate the very directness of the message this morning. And you, you might be here and you say, man, I understand every bit of that. And that's excellent that you understand it. And you might have already answered that question. As a eunuch asked, how can I understand this? But if you've never taken what you understand and applied it personally to your life, it's not worth anything. So what do you mean, Pastor? You can know what it is to receive Christ as your Savior, but you've never done it. You've heard it just like so many people have heard it so many times. But you, personally, haven't had a God and I time. Where specifically you ask Christ to save you. And if you've never done that, I beg you, don't run to me. Run to him. Oh, we would love for you to run to us so that we could show you how you can know Christ. But that still won't save you. God is the only one that can save you. And so I encourage you. You say, I really don't know how to do this, but I know I need to do this. You can come. We'll take you to a room privately, and we'll show you from Scripture exactly how every human being that's ever been born again, how they were able to be born again. They admitted that they were a sinner. They agreed with Christ. And they said, Christ, you're the only one that can save me. And I put my faith and trust in you to save my soul. And I ask you to do that right now. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, that's you. That includes me. That includes Pastor Matt. So if you've never done that, I encourage you to do that. If you're there and you say, I've done that, but I haven't done the baptism thing. Well, I encourage you, the first step of obedience as a born-again Christian is to identify with the Lord Jesus Christ in the waters of baptism. It's a public identification of what's happened on the inside to you, publicly showing to those that show up, this is what has happened to me. And if you've never done that since you've been born again, I encourage you to do that. Many of you have come here and before you join the church, you say, well, we always ask if you've been born again, if you've been baptized. And it's always in that order. As you read this passage, specifically this passage, shows you exactly he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he received him as his Savior, then he was baptized. And after you're born again and been baptized, then you join the local church. It's always in that order. It's never in another different order. And I know many people have come and they said, well, I was baptized when I was an infant. Well, praise the Lord you were baptized when you were an infant, but you don't even remember it. And many of you will say, yeah, I don't remember that at all. I was baptized, and I didn't remember it until I looked at some pictures my mom showed me when I was younger. 
But on November the 10th, 1980, I received Christ my Savior, and I was baptized after that. And I'll never forget that. Never forget that. And that was the way that I did it in order. I received Christ, then I got baptized, then I joined the local church. Today in the society we live in today, joining the local church is not very important to a lot of people. And there are people who have been coming here for a long time that still aren't a member of the local church. And you say, but wait a minute, I come all the time, I give, I do, I understand that. So it should be easy, right? My question is, why aren't you a part of the local church? You say, I don't see the need in that. It was important that God put it down and that people were part of the local church. So I encourage you. I don't argue with you. I just encourage you to do what God says to do. And when you do, that local body of believers grows stronger. Because we're a local body, when one part of the body doesn't do what's right, it's not as strong as it can be. So I encourage you, I encourage you, do what God would have you to do. And when you do, praise the Lord. It's the perfect thing to do is what he wants you to do. Some's here this morning and you say, you know what? I think God is calling me into full-time ministry and I'm X amount years old. As far as I know, I've never read you've got to be this age or you've got to be below this age in order for you in full-time ministry. I mean, he showed you clearly, very clearly. It's just about being obedient to what God would have you to do. No matter where you're at, no matter what's going on in your life, to say, you know what, Lord? I'm going to do what you called me to do, and I don't understand it. And I tell you, by, by, by own personal testimony, when you don't understand it, you can pretty much guarantee it's from him. Because I just don't understand that. Why now? Where I'm at? What I'm doing? You've got to be kidding me. Nope. God's greater than any plan A you have in plan B and plan C. He's the only one with the right plan for your life. So whatever it is this morning, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And we're going to sing two verses, okay? I'll just tell you up front. We'll sing two verses. And you made that first verse say, well, I don't want to. If you want to come, I encourage you to come. I encourage you to come down to the altar and pray. Nobody's going to attack you. Nobody's going to look at you and laugh at you. But I would come and talk to him. I would encourage you to do that. Be obedient to whatever he'd have you to do. Jesus is calling you. He's calling us tenderly every single day. As we sing, you come. Jesus is tenderly calling you home. Oh